I get so many questions asked about marijuana, CBD oil, and cannabinoids as it relates to prostate cancer. Will it cure my prostate cancer? Can I just smoke weed and that's the cure for prostate cancer? Today, that's what we'll talk about. Let's go. Welcome to the Dr. Geo Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Geo, where it is my goal to help you with your urological and prostate problems and help you live better with age. Today's podcast episode is exciting for me because it's a, I get tons of questions asked about this, and it's about medical marijuana, CBD, and prostate cancer. I got to tell you... <laughs> That I get probably at least one question a day asked on this topic, uh, whether it's through email, social media, my patient, uh, all the time. And there was a time where I said, "Look, I don't know." I, there was a time where I really didn't know, uh, and and I was, you know, I, had, I was compelled roughly about six months ago or so uh, when we had an interview with Dr. Fernstein. If you remember, it's on a pod, uh, on the podcast on uh, his cannabinoid book cookbook. Right, so I had to do some research um, back then. Um, I, I've done tons of research since then. I've uh, spoken to many patients, and so I feel really comfortable uh, with having this conversation with you today on, you know, medical marijuana and prostate cancer. Should I start smoking weed? Uh, should I just start taking the oils? What should I do? And so let's talk about that. And let me give you a little overview as to how these things work. It turns out that. In your body, throughout your whole body, you have these receptors called cannabinoid receptors, right? And you have two types. You have cannabinoid receptor one and you have cannabinoid receptor two. You know, the other day I was talking to my 10-year-old son and he's, uh, he says, Dad, what do you do for a living? And he said, I said, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm an integrative and functional uh, medicine doctor and I work in urology. Urology? What's urology? Uh, urology is, you know, deals with the prostate and other urological organs. Prostate, what is that? So he kept asking me actually really good questions uh, where I had to really think of how, how do I break this down so that my son can understand what I do? And that's sort of the approach I want to take here with you because, and, and, and trust me, I'm, not in, I'm, I'm hoping not to insult your intelligence, um, but I think it's very important to um, keep things simple so that um, with a science-based format so that you can take action right away. That's the, that's always the goal with anything you read, anything you hear with regards to Dr. Geo is I am here for you. You're not here for me. And let's give you actionable items so that you can take charge of your own health, right? So we're going to do this with this episode today. So let's go. Receptors. What's a receptor? How do these receptors work in the body? Well, it turns out that for any uh, major effect in the body, a response, whether it's a hormone like testosterone, that it attaches to a receptor called an androgen receptor, um, any other chemical, uh, adrenaline, whatever, all these chemicals attach to a receptor and they only work if they can attach to this receptor, right? So, Throughout your body, you have these cannabinoid receptors, CB1, cannabinoid receptor 2, cannabinoid receptor uh, 1 and 2. For example, in your brain, you have cannabinoid receptor 1. And other parts of the body, you have some cannabinoid receptor 1, like the bladder. And in other parts of your body, the liver, the the, the pancreas, uh, the gastrointestinal system, the immune cells, they have CB2 or cannabinoid receptor two. Okay. Okay. Dr. Jay, you're still not explaining what, what, it, what this means. All right. The way I explained it to Leo, my son, it was the following. I said, look, go ahead and put this key in that lock. All right. So let's just say that this key is the chemical. In our case, here's a cannabinoid. And that, uh, uh, the whole, uh, the keyhole is the receptor. And I sort of gave him the wrong key that didn't fit. So put this key in that lock. And he puts the key, tries to put it in, it gets stuck and he doesn't go in. So Oh, that's not the right key, is it? All right, try this key. And I knew this next key, he can fit into the lock, 
but it, it won't twist. It won't, it won't turn. And then he goes, puts it in. Uh, it doesn't turn. That's right. Right. So it's still the wrong key, though it's a better key. Right. It fits in, but it doesn't turn. Try this key. And then he tries that key, boom, and then turn it to turn. He opens a door. That's a, a scenario where a chemical in the body, uh, we're going to stick to our topic here. Cannabinoids attaches to a receptor where the, re the cannabinoid attaches to that specific receptor and it sort of fits in perfectly, turns the key. And then now, now there's a response. What's the response? Anything. Well, I mean, we're, we're going to talk about that, right? Whether it's um, feeling high, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, feeling elated, um, whether it's um, less pain, like turning off some pain receptors, whether it's turning off cancer cells, right? Whatever the response is. So these cannabinoid receptors are like the, uh, uh, the, like the um, ho uh, keyhole that attaches to a receptor, right? So you have these throughout your whole body. The thing is that there's about a hundred cannabinoids. One of them, of course, is THC, which is what's found in substances like marijuana. And THC has a very specific um, uh, structure where it fits very nicely to CB1. CB1 is found in the brain. So that's why people feel elated and high because it fits actually fits perfectly, perfect key. And then you can turn the key and you get high. So that's THC. Um, as best as we know, none of the other uh, cannabinoids causes that effect like THC. So when, you know, I remember the college days. So I, you know, I, <laughs> let me tell you that I, I honestly, I've never smoked weed and I've never inhaled anything. No, this is not a Bill Clinton scenario <laughs> where, you know, I, I promise I never inhaled. This is not that. I really never inhaled anything. So, uh, and I'm not saying uh, this for any uh, reason uh, that to hold me up high on a pedestal because I think that, you know, those who smoke weed, even back then, uh, when we thought negatively of it was fine. Certainly now we know more and we're going to talk about that. Um, but I've never tried it. So I have no ax to grind here, right? It's not like, oh, I want to make sure that marijuana is, you know, everybody uses marijuana because, you know, biases. I No bias here. I've never done it, no for no other reason. And maybe at some point, if I have chronic pain, I absolutely will, right? But THC, right? So marijuana typically has high levels of THC and depends who's the vendor, right? Is it the dude in the corner or the other guy, you know, depending on um, the higher you, the higher you get, the more high you get uh, will depend on the THC content in that joint, right? That, that's just an example. Again, there's about a hundred cannabinoids um, in the plant, in the ca cannabis plant. And all of them have a different effect. And quite honestly, we don't know how many of them, uh, how they work. Um, too well, anyway. Um, cannabis has been used medicinally for about 5,000 years. So this is nothing new necessarily. It's new in terms of research and the science that's behind it, but it, it's been around for a long, long time and used medicinally for uh, fatigue, for uh, eczema, uh, for um, rheumatoid arthritis, malaria, multiple things. So it's been around for a long time until the 1930s or so where um, in Europe and then in the U.S. it became illegal. And I'm not getting into the politics of it, of course, uh, but it was since it was illegal, it's, it's used uh, more sparingly, uh, though still used uh, illegally by many, of course. There's other chemicals in the cannabis plant. So there's these flavonoids and other chemicals that are, might have beneficial effects. They have not been studied. What has been studied to some degree is, are these cannabinoids uh, that, again, attaches to these uh, receptors. Um, and the other thing I want to say before we continue about cannabis is that your body has its own sort of cannabis pharmacy in the body already. So it's a matter of releasing those uh, chemicals that are very similar to cannabis or cannabinoids and they, for them to attach those receptors, okay? And these receptors, uh, again, are all over. Cannabis can be addictive. The problems that occur with substances like any a substance that can be addictive, whether it's alcohol or other drugs, are not as severe seemingly as cannabis. So, um, this is, and this has been studied that, um, you know, clearly we have way more of a problem with opioids 
than we've ever had with cannabis. We have way more of a problem even with alcohol than we've ever had, you know, with cannabis. So it's significantly less of a problem, a societal problem from a disorder causing deaths than um, all these other substances. And this is, again, this is objective information. How do you take these cannabinoids? How do I get these cannabinoids in my body? Well, the main methods of getting, of getting ca- uh, cannabinoids in your body is inhalation through vapes or, you know, a rolled up joint, or you consume it uh, like in gummies or you know, cannabinoid crackers or cookies or things like that. So you, you, you digest it. And, and those are the main methods. I know some of you, <laughs> you've told, some of you, some of you are using cannabinoid suppositories for your prostate. I can't tell you yay or nay on that. Okay. That is completely experimental and, uh, people are just becoming really creative uh, about it. And, um, I can't, so the, the goal there is what, right? How can we get these cannabinoids to get right into my prostate? So it has to go through your rectum and kind of go through the rectal wall and get to the prostate. That sounds good. And it probably is indeed the case, but we don't know with regards to cannabinoid. Uh, suppositories, I cannot tell you if it works or if it doesn't. I could probably tell you that there's no real um, bad side effects from it. Before we go on and say, all right, cannabinoids and prostate can- can- uh, cancer, should I take it? Does it work? Let me say, give you a never- general overview because I think it's important because sometimes what you guys are taking for prostate cancer, you have to ask the question, how is this affecting me systemically? Okay, I think it's good for prostate cancer and it might be, but Will it induce other cancers? Will it cause a heart attack? Will it cause, um, I don't know, brain problems, right? So you always have to ask that question, okay, good for prostate cancer, maybe, or there's a decent amount of evidence that it works. How will it Will it affect my body systemically? So let me give you a general overview of of my thoughts and some of my research with regards to that. It does seem, and let me give you the bad news first. (laughs) All right. You want the good news or bad news? All right, let's do bad news first. The bad news is, and there's no good news or bad news. It just is, and you have to kind of figure it out uh, and take your chances if that's what you want to do. In men who smoke a lot of weed. And so I don't know what a lot of weed is. Uh, these studies are not clear, but you know, they smoke about every day. I, I don't know how many joints a day, right? So uh, <laughs> since marijuana is legal in many states uh, in the United States, uh, both for recreational and medicinal use, I mean, some guys are just walking around with a joint. <laughs> Everyone, Mike Tyson is one of them. Every time I see him, he's like with a joint. Uh, and so forth, which again, uh, you know, I'm not judging. Um, it does seem to lower sperm count by about 30%. So if you're interested in you know, having babies, having kids, understand that smoking marijuana or smoking a lot of marijuana, and that's where the, that's the crux of the problem. We don't know what that toxic dose is. What if you smoke one joint a week? What if you smoke a joint every other week or every other day? I don't know. Okay. So it could be that these excessive marijuana smokers are the ones that are most affected. So it does seem to reduce sperm count by about 30%. Not only sperm count, but even the overall health of the sperm, right? So sperm cells need to uh, swim well, swim fast. They have a nice tail. They look a certain way and they kind of don't look healthy under a microscope in those that, uh, those men that smoke a lot of marijuana. Okay. So it does seem to promote male infertility. Okay. That's the bad news. Uh, how about a little bit more <laughs> bad news? <laughs> So does smoking marijuana lower my testosterone? That's a great question. I So animal studies show that it might. Some human studies, not as much. And in my experience in, with men that I see that smoke marijuana, um, I don't see that. Now, what's the dose? How many joints are they smoking a day or a week or in a lifetime, right? I don't know. What I do know also is that I'm not sure that it lowers testosterone per se, but in other studies looking at prostate cancer, and we will go over that, it seems to reduce 
the amount of androgen receptors that are produced. So you remember the lock and key scenario, right? So in this case, it's testosterone. Androgen receptor has to fit perfectly. You need, in order to, um, and we're going to talk about testosterone and you can read on drgeo.com. Uh, I write about this. It, it's not a matter of having a lot of testosterone. It's also a matter of, do you have enough receptors for these, te- for the, for all this testosterone? So you need enough receptors and you need healthy receptors for the testosterone to do what it does. It seems that marijuana smokers, um, have, um, don't make as much androgen receptors as non-smokers. Okay, so whether it's just low testosterone or whether it's a matter of lowering the amount of testosterone that's produced or both, it may have a um, a low testosterone effect where there's less libido, perhaps some erectile dysfunction, uh, more fatigue and so forth. That is the overview that is not related to cancer or prostate cancer. And with that in mind, um, I want to tell you about um, a sponsor that we now have called XODX Prostate Test, uh, which is a urine test that I actually use is probably the main mm-hmm. test at this point that I use and many of my colleagues use um, to determine if a man have has um, high risk prostate cancer. Uh, if you know, uh, if you read uh, or heard my podcast in the past, I'm, we're not trying to find uh, you know, low risk prostate cancer. We're really trying to find high risk where if you do a treatment, it will save your life. So I find that the XODS prostate test, which is a urine test, um, and it does not require a prostate exam, uh, is a really good test that is more specific and sensitive to prostate cancer than the PSA test. And it's after tw- 2019, it made it to the uh, national cancer guidelines as a early detection method to detect for aggressive uh, uh, prostate cancer. So thank you for XO, uh, to XODX for sponsoring this episode. Can- cannabinoids and cancer. I'm going to get to prostate cancer. Stay with me. But first, we need to talk about testicular cancer. There again, there seems to be a higher likelihood amongst marijuana smokers. So these are not CBD oil takers. This is marijuana smokers and testicular cancer. Testicular cancer happens most frequently uh, with younger men. I've seen a few cases in older men, but typically they're in their 20s when it's found. If you remember uh, Lance Armstrong, you know, I think he was in his 20s. Um, and the good news about testicular cancer, when people say, God, chemotherapy, uh, I'm not doing chemotherapy. Everybody dies from chemotherapy. This is true. Maybe 95% of the times chemotherapy is a, is a beast, uh, but it's one of the uh, therapeutic approaches that actually does work for testicular cancer in any event. It seems that marijuana smoking increases the risk of testicular cancer. So what you would want to do is, um, so how I go about it in my practice is uh, I look for genetic mutations uh, that are cancer related. So I do all these saliva tests that will tell me, yep, you know, uh, Bob is, has a high risk of testicular cancer. Bob, Look, I don't know. I mean, if you need to smoke marijuana, I would just not do it every day or some kind of guidance to make sure that they don't um, develop testicular cancer. Um, If they are at risk, um, that's what I would do. If they're not at risk, we don't know the dosage of how much marijuana to smoke, okay? But we'll go there in a second. But I would would be less um, concerned about Bob, who has a risk of testicular cancer. Okay, so I would, that's the approach that I would take. Enough of the bad news with uh, marijuana smoking and, uh, and CBD. What's the good news? The good news is that there seems to be, and this is association, not causation, okay? So in a large group of men uh, called the California Men's Health Study, there seems to be an inverse association between cannabis use and prostate cancer development compared to others who don't smoke uh, marijuana. So there seems to be a positive association. Again, it's an association, which I find those to be fine. I mean, they looked at about 
85,000 participants. So while I understand that association causation is not correlation, when you're looking at a large group of people, association does seem to matter, at least to some degree or a large degree. Let me also say this, just like studying nutrition and trying to figure out if red meat is good for you or bad for you, or try to figure out if, you know, uh, chicken is good or bad. It's very difficult to discern that information from studies because there's a lot of variables involved. So going back to how marijuana is bad, in one of the studies, for example, they also showed, and I think it was a testicular study, uh, where there was a higher risk of cancer. They also showed that these people were also smokers. They smoked a lot of cigarettes. So we don't know if the problem was from smoking cigarettes or marijuana or both, right? So there's a lot of variables involved. It's just like eating red meat. Oh, red meat is bad for cancer. Really? I mean, I look at the research all the time. Says who? Uh, It might be neutral. I wouldn't say that it's beneficial for prostate cancer, but is it bad for prostate cancer? Because most red meat eaters have other bad habits. So this notion of, you know, not everybody's following a paleo diet, for example, right? Which is like clean food, grass-fed beef and this like that. No, typically when you look at studies, the red meat eaters are unhealthy people. Uh, They uh, smoke, uh, they drink alcohol and so forth. And sometimes I have to say some of the studies do a really good job to kind of look at those variables and leave those variables out and look at as much as possible as, you know, the, the substance that they're studying and very little else. But most of the studies that people are quoting out there, uh, they're, they're, the lifestyle of these red meat eaters are, you know, suboptimal. So this is the same thing with marijuana. So that's another point that I wanted to make. So, but it seems to be a fine thing for and lower the risk of bladder cancer as it relates to this study. One other urological benefit, which it's uh, it considers urinary urgency, which I know a lot. I know a lot of you. I think that's another one that uh, a day doesn't go by where uh, urinary urgency or uh, incontinence, where you're leaking. Right, you can hold you. You, you go to the bathroom, and uh, sometimes I have a patient that uh, takes like two minutes to pee, and then after he pees, he still is like leaking afterwards. Right, um, all these urological issues. It does seem like a combined extract of THC and another type of cannabinoid called cannabidiol, cannabidiol, which a lot of it comes from the hemp, the hemp plant. Um, they looked at a group of subjects uh, for eight weeks, and they did find there was less incontinence and urgency, primarily in people with advanced multiple sclerosis. Will it work in people that don't have MS? Probably, but certainly in people with MS, it seems to help. Uh, By the way, multiple sclerosis is a neurological problem where uh, the nervous system is deteriorating. And so then if the nervous system is deteriorating, particularly the nerves that innervate or that go to, they hit the bladder, then um, that's not going to control urine well. So there's urgency and incontinence and so forth. And it seems to help patients with MS. We spoke about cannabidiol a minute ago as we talked about MS. Um, Let me say this about cannabidiol because there's a lot of product, hemp products out there that um, are sold um, as a CBD, uh, as a cannabinoid. And again, there's a lot of cannabinoids and not all of them attach to the right receptor, whether it's receptor one or receptor two. So you don't want to get duped out there. So cannabidiol, which is primarily comes from the hemp plant, seems it might have some benefit, but it doesn't bind strongly to CB1 or CB2 receptors. So what does that mean? Lock and key. You put that key into that lock, it is going to be there strong, right? Um, Yeah, you can pull it out, but, you know, it's not going to come out that smoothly, right? Particularly when you turn it, it's not going to come out at all. Cannabidiol from hemp doesn't bind strongly to these receptors. There might still be benefit from these hemp products, uh, that include, um, you know, uh, relaxation, uh, mood. It may have a mood benefit. May have a may help with pain. So I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm saying that based on research, it doesn't um, it doesn't bind strongly. So it may work temporarily. 
or in some cases not work at all, like in anything else. One last thing, one last thing. How about smoking weed and erections and erectile, erectile dysfunction? I have to tell you about this, right? Because this is a, what, what, what's the theme of the podcast? Urological and live better with age. So this hits both. There again, um, I thought I was done. <laughs> I thought I was done with bad news and cannabis. There again, in long studies, it does show that smoking weed has a, a an inverse effect so it's it 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 promotes erectile dysfunction but let me be clear a in my clinic i have not seen that often or if i've seen that the patient does smoke weed and has ed i am not sure necessarily that is due to cannabis and there's many components to ed so we don't want to oversimplify that the other component is that the dose are they smoking every day? Are they smoking twice a day? Are they always with a stove, you know, with a, <laughs> with, 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 you know, the, are they smoking all day? Right. And I think that has an uh, effect as well. So I do think, um, I think the poison is in the dose as it relates to marijuana, as it relates to CBD oil. Um, um, we don't know. And as it relates to vapes and things like that, there's a lot that we don't know. But just because we don't know the specifics, you know, uh, I get a lot of patients that are are doing well, uh, you know, they from pain or uh, I know that there's a there's several pharmaceutical drugs out there that come from cannabis, uh, cannabis to or cannabinoids uh, that are used for epilepsies, for example, right for ep- epilepsy. So there's benefit there. Let's go to prostate cancer real quick because this is I set up the stage for you. Now let's go to it. Dr. Gio, I started using these, this can, cannabinoid oil, CBD oil, and that cured my prostate cancer. I tell you that it was, it was the oil. I, it was the oil and nothing else changed. So this is the type of um, uh, information that I get sometimes. Um, and, you know, anecdotal information, I can't make a lot out of it because it's anecdotal, right? And there's a lot of anecdotes out there that, you know, I have to be responsible. But, you know, when enough people tell me, look, I, I you know, I, I, I took the CBD oil and it helped. I, I'm not ignoring it, but, you know, I can't make clinical decisions based on one or two anecdotes. So here's where we are with the science as it relates to medical marijuana, CBD and prostate cancer. It does seem that prostate cancer cells have CBD. 1 and CB2 receptors. So the receptors are around these cancer cells and they're both, both are there. It does seem based on animal studies that there is some regression of prostate cancer from exposure of cannabinoid chemicals, right? So it does seem to, there does seem to be some benefit. Let me give you a 10 second, 20 second overview of what we're trying to accomplish as it relates to prostate cancer or, or any cancer, but certainly as it relates to cancer, uh, prostate cancer. What we're trying to accomplish is the following. We're trying to stop that cell from growing. We want to stop that cell from spreading. And we want to stop that cell from sticking to other cells because that's what's going to cause the spread. So we don't want these cells to survive, grow, spread, or stick to anything. And one other thing, Whatever we do to try to stop these cells from surviving, growing, spreading, and attaching to anything, we don't want that substance to be toxic to our healthy cells. We, we want to be greedy, right? We want our broccoli and eat it too. So this is why chemotherapy can, of course, stop some cells, cancer cells from growing, but is very toxic to healthy cells and even cancerous to healthy cells as well. So this is why chemotherapy can be uh, sometimes a problem. As it relates to cannabinoids and prostate cancer, the studies have shown that those cancer cells, again, animal studies, and and I'm okay with animal studies, and I'm okay if you say, well, I'm going to take CBD oil from those animal studies. I'm okay with it as long as you can find. I'm not, because science and to study and to research is so darn difficult and expensive, I cannot wait for that $100 million study to be over in 10 years and then five years after that, it gives us a result 
So it takes 15 years for me to make a determination of, all right, I'll utilize it, uh, utilize the substance therapeutically for prostate cancer or not. I can't do that. I don't have that luxury. So if you're saying, hey, based on animal studies, I'm willing to take some CBD oil, great. If you're willing to say, yeah, we don't know what cannabinoids are may have an effect, but I'm just going to take a CBD oil that, and take a chance. Because um, there is a, still a, a scarcity of research in this area, I don't therapeutically give patients yet for prostate cancer CBD oil or any cannabinoids of any kind. But if they're telling me, hey, I'm taking a CBD oil and I want to keep taking it, by all means, go for it. This is about you, you being proactive. Or if they're telling me, look, I'm going to smoke weed, fine. Don't abuse it. And we'll talk about that in a second. So based on some of the animal research that I've seen, there seems to be more cancer cells of the prostate dying and regressing from exposure to cannabinoids. And part of how that works is that it seems to uh, discourage the formation of blood cells, of blood vessels around the cancer cells. So one of the things with cancer cells in terms of it growing and spreading is that they start formulating their own blood cells and blood vessels, like their own circulatory system. These cancer cells are very smart. So you want to stop them from formulating blood vessels. It seems that CBD discourages the formation of these uh, tumor blood vessels, which then there will be less uh, feeding of the tumor and less growth. All right, Dr. Gio, great. I have prostate cancer. What do I do? I'm ready. I'm ready. I don't know. Yeah, the medicinal marijuana shop is in the corner. They're all over the place, but it's a little bit of the wild, wild west. And I've spoken to experts in the area and it's a little bit of the wild, wild west out there still. It's getting better, but still it's not uh, regulated by the government. Right. Um, and it's a little of, you don't know what you're getting. Um, you don't know, um, uh, which brand to get, uh, what type of cannabinoids, um, should I do THC? Should I not? Uh, which is the type that has, I, we don't know. So I, I cannot make recommendations yet. Uh, maybe I will soon. And, and you are going to tell me, oh, I know of a place. This place is good. And it's hard to tell. Again, I've spoken to marijuana experts, doctors from California. I mean, this is the first state that legalized it. And they're saying, look, it's very hard. It's very hard to get, you know, to, to know what you're getting. Okay. That being said, it might, you know, if you're taking a CBD oil, I think that's fine. Um, and, and, and so on. In, in cases with more advanced prostate cancer, where that now there's pain and, um, sometimes there's, um, less appetite, marijuana, medical marijuana seems to work very well to help with pain and with less side effects that, of course, than opioids. Um, it helps with, um, stimulating, uh, appetite, helps with sleep. Actually, THC can help with sleep as well. So this is why a lot of guys tell me, look, I, I have to smoke a joint before I go to sleep. That helps me sleep. I take a couple of puffs, right? Um, which is fine. Uh, again, we don't know the dosage, the, the proper dosage. But, uh, you know, oftentimes I get the, the feedback. I, I just take two, two, two drags, uh, two or three drags, and that's all I need. Perfect. It seems to be legal uh, in many states, about 37 states in the U.S., uh, for both recreational and medicinal uh, um, aspects. Um, uh, New York's one of them, California, many states. Uh, you can look that up. What state? So Texas is not, uh, it's not legal in Texas, as an example. Um, nothing against Texas, of course. Actually, I don't think it's legal in Texas, but I see... Uh, Joe Rogan smoking pot in Austin, Texas. All the time, so maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, lastly, I'll say this. And how, do, how, does your, how can you get your body to make cannabinoids? That's a good question. Um, you can eat cannabinoids from like chocolate. And you want to check out Dr. Fernstein cookbook, the cannabinoid cookbook. It's very good. But chocolate is high in cannabinoids. Maybe that's why we feel so good after eating chocolate. Um, also, this runner's high that many runners feel, those neurotransmitters, those chemicals are cannabinoid-like and they stimulate cannabinoid receptors. So there's several ways of making it yourself. I'm not saying that those are the methods, you know, eat more chocolate for prostate cancer. Or, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, 
uh, you know, eat good chocolate. I think good chocolate does have anti-cancer properties. It's good for prostate cancer. And it might be because of these cannabinoids or many other chemicals that are involved in it. Quick takeaway is, hey, CBD oil, marijuana might be fine. It's all about the dosage. We don't know the dosage. You can go for it. It depends on your situation and what your needs are. It can be an addictive substance like anything else. Food. Food is an addictive substance. So, uh, you know, many things are. So be careful with the addictive component of it. Um, not a whole lot of side effects. If you're of younger age and you want to have kids and things like that, and you want to be more careful with it uh, as it does reduce semen count by a lot. And um, thanks again for the XODX prostate test uh, company for helping us and sponsoring this episode. This is Dr. Geo signing off. I'll talk to you next time.